Okay, well, welcome to the presentation. Uh, we're going to hold off questions until the end. Uh, so we'll do a Q&A session at the very end here. Uh, there's a lot of material to actually to get through. And um, uh, I think we'll just uh, be able to post this on uh, onto the, the interwebs um, without the Q&A um, and just a straight presentation. So without further ado, let's, let's jump right into it. Uh, the life of spies is to know and not be known by, that's a quote from George Herbert, a Welsh poet. And I think this is a good way to kind of start off the conversation. When we think of spies, we think of, you know, we're going to use terms like spy or an operative or, you know, case officer, or agent, you know, these people who are a part of our intelligence community or other intelligence communities around the world, they're prime objective is to know things, to understand what's going on in the world, and then produce assessments or products that they can give to policymakers so that they can make the decisions. And, you know, in a sense, this is a form of national security, or it is a form of national security. And in a sense, it's a form of defense. Uh, and I think that we can take a lot of this, the concepts of tradecraft and apply it to self-defense. Uh, that we can know more about our environment, know about what's going on around us so that we can make better decisions, better make ju better judgment calls and be uh, a safer. Um, and the being unknown part is the kind of, that's the, that's the interesting part. Um, doing what you're doing at a low key, um, communicating or doing some, you know, what we'd call covert actions, um, even things that, you know, you, you can do measures in which people won't even know what you're doing, um, but you can apply them to keep yourself safe. And so uh, it's all about keeping kind of that low signature uh, so that you're unknown. And in that anonymity, in, in being underground, in the actions of what you're doing that are being underground, there is a, a blanket of safety um, that gives you a level of protection that um, exposure will not. It's more of an exposure, really. <laughs> so who am I, uh, where I come from? I am a blogger. Uh, I blog, I call it Black Swan Outdoors, obviously. Um, on the blog we do, it, it, we, we focus on uh, the original intent of the blog was to focus on emergency preparedness, hence the Black Swan, and, uh, you know, um, um, title uh, and outdoors referring to the things I like to do out of, the, out of doors, so hunting, fishing, camping, uh, backpacking, that kind of thing. Uh, but really, in the, when we started the blog, it had morphed very quickly. It did a little bit of spy skills, kind of urban survival type focus. It was kind of the where the, the we began and the journey through uh, the development of, in particular, the last administration has really kind of taken the blog um, to focus more specifically on self defense, security culture, uh, and um, and then becoming more and more politicized. Um, and I think that politics is everything. Politics is understanding. Um, the power structures of your government. And what has been happening here in America in particular is something that's being echoed across America, whether you're in Brazil or France or Hungary. Um, and that is the rise of the political right, of those that don't want to see change um, happening, those who want to restrict rights and liberties and freedoms from people. Um, you know, we see and try to stand in solidarity with the people of Hong Kong, as an example, or, um, you know, in uh, Rio de Janeiro, um, in, through their strife and their struggles. Um, 2016 was a landmark year because it was the time in which um, our government in America, in a way, kind of began a full-throated attack against American citizens uh, in, a, in a culture war. Um, and we saw in, in many ways the, um, the writings on the wall, the foreshadowing through Viktor Orban in Hungary, for example, 
or Duarte in, in the Philippines. And a lot of the political tactics that Viktor Orban had taken advantage of were used in the last administration. And the same with the ways in which Duarte was able to get elected um, and using social media in a, a new and very disingenuous way um, that the administration was able to do that as well. And it so happened that the policies that were being put forward fit nicely with the policies of an adversarial governments around the world, in particular with Russia. And the Russia collusion, Russia interference component to our democracy was really important um, and was under downplayed, of course, politically. Um, but then after the insurrection or before the insurrection, we had our own um, electoral uh, questioning happening. Um, and all of that kind of fed into each other to, to kind of the instruction that we saw in January. And I think that this kind of evolution is something really important to, to talk about. And we have talked about it as it relates to, um, you know, to an individual's defense. Um, we're transitioning to go back into the original intent a little bit more with outdoor skills, in particular with um, emergency preparedness. Because we've witnessed in the last few years, but in this last year in particular, uh, natural disasters in the form of hurricanes and tornadoes, derechos um, that we always do, but with greater intensity. Um, and we know that climate change is an issue uh, fueling the, the, the effects of this. Texas is a great example of the, of the, the great freeze down there. Um, the issues that became politicized like the coronavirus uh, not only directly killed people by the lack of attention of the administration because they wanted to re, re they wanted to win their um, uh, re-election, um, but also then the unintended consequences of the of the vitriol of the violent language uh, and people being targeted, uh, Asian Americans in particular, um, out of the frustration and anger that they had because um, there was a blame to be made, which is you know, ridiculous because there's no one to really blame. It's a pandemic. Uh, but we saw this parallel through policies, um, you know, when you had the Tree of Life shooting uh, that was directly connected to the anti-Semiticism of QAnon and QAnon supporters and the Trump policy um, that had put, that was anti-Semitic. Uh, and then you had, you know, the El Paso shooter um, in Walmart that also had been following the, ex the violent uh, rhetoric from the Trump administration's immigration policies. And certainly at the beginning of those policies, you saw that people being targeted, in, uh, the Latino and uh, Latina Americans being f targeted by vi violence. You know, people who were born here or immigrated here who consider this, this country theirs, um, no longer felt comfortable in their own country. Um, and then the same goes with, with uh, the people in the Islamic community. You know, we got to the point where imams, um, you know, were going and getting concealed carry licenses uh, so that they could help protect um, their prayers at, you know, um, in the, at the mosques and, and, and cultural centers. Um, because, you know, whether it was synagogues or, um, uh, all types of temples, all types of religious things that weren't white Christian um, temples were being attacked, you know, from Dylan Roof to the Sikh. Um, and all of this kind of underscores the, the, the cultural tensions that have been happening in America and how much the Trump administration really put a lot of fuel in the flames of, of these acts and actions. You know, the, the CNN bomber is a good example of just the fanaticism. And then of course, all of the QAnon and the white supremacy that the administration had been supporting from Charlottesville all the way on to, to the insurrection. And so we see all this stuff happening and um, there's very few people actually kind of weaving these stories together. Um, and the people who had positioned themselves to be uh, kind of the, st the stewards in ways or the protectors, you know, these people who call themselves sheepdogs could not be you know, community sheepdogs uh, because they weren't protecting people. They were protecting 
limited amount of people, specifically um, the people that were like them. And you see the prepper movement um, became a huge joke because it became, because of these issues of climate change, of a pandemic and civil strife became politicized, uh, they became no longer were they true threats. You know, so these people had dreamed about the fact that they were so well prepared in a great national or natural disaster, national disaster or national disaster, and they completely failed across the board as a community um, because of what they were um, on the po politics side. Um, they, they couldn't address the issues, even if it's some, something as, as drastic and, and great as you know, climate change heading down among them or the pandemic, the effects of the pandemic. Um, and so now you have, we have a pitted re America or re America is pitted against each other in two different, very distinct realities. Um, and, and even in it's, it's dividing even in places like professional classes where you have uh, doctors um, or, you know, health professionals who don't wear masks or police officers who are unsympathetic to um, you know, cultural uh, strifes and racial strifes that have been then been growing, you know. So we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But so we've been writing this blog for a while. This is kind of what we're talking about, and we're trying to uh, do be more active now in in not just writing passively about what's going on, but actually working to help and shape and make a difference in protecting people. Um, so that's kind of where we're at with the with the blog and, and myself and the intent, um, in particular, of learning or learning and teaching um, basic tradecraft. So, you know, when we're talking about tradecraft, it's it's about un operating undetected in hostile environments, and it's a skill that can be taught and learned. And I think that this is really important because so much of tradecraft or spycraft, if you want to call it that. Um, this, these skills are uh, portrayed in movies and TV, and oftentimes by characters who are, you know, super elite, uh, super well trained. They have almost superhuman abilities, and we think of that as, you know, that's kind of commonplace. Sometimes, you know, that all operatives are like this are like James Bond, with, you know. Are, uh, or adjacent born, but it could be farther from the truth. They're, they're very normal, regular, everyday citizens. Um, yes, they have some training, um, but they're not superhuman. And everything that they learn and they do, you know, when they're going off into a, an adversarial country to try to turn people to, you know, provide secrets about that country, I mean, they're doing this without a firearm. And the punishment is death by firing squad, um, torture, imprisonment for life. And here in America, we have people who are so scared about living in their community that they, they can't go to a church without a firearm. So um, we have some issues that we need to work out um, in, in our country. And we have a lot of issues that we need to address. And I think that understanding basic tradecraft is going to gives people the ability to do it in a safe, uh, to address these issues in a safe um, manner uh, and a way in which could protect themselves and their organizations. Um, so, you know, we often think of, you know, again, this is kind of an extension of this is that, you know, elite, um, you know, special warfare off warriors, um, like special forces and Navy SEALs, um, are thought of being, you know, romanticized of being elite, and they're truly not elite. They're special in the sense that they have special training, uh, but again, they're not any more elite than anyone else. And you know, we have a lot of people that come from the in, in the intelligence community and coming from special warfare's that finish their tours of duty and they try to cash in on that experience. And a lot of people don't understand the nuance and the difference between an individual who, yes, had gotten training and yes, was given the opportunity to do lots of practice, say with firearms, but they were never deployed or they only were in that position for maybe four years or, you know, six years or whatever, but never really got gathered any kind of experiences. 
they're never sent off and actually did anything. Um, and and then they're trying to cash in on this, you know, kind of, um, you know, you hear the term the fog of, mar of war. And what these people are using is kind of the fog of marketing. And uh, there's a lot of disingenuous and very poor information that's pouring out of these communities. Um, and, uh, and I think that the, you know, whether it be emergency preparedness or whether it be in, in firearms defense, um, that uh, there isn't, um, there is a lot of, a, a lot of fantasy and marketing that's put into place uh, to sell products and training uh, modules. So the goals of this course, um, today we're gonna separate the course into two sections. Uh, trade and craft. So the first part of this presentation or this course is going to be on learning uh, who uses tradecraft and why. And then we're going to talk about understanding the tactics of intelligence gathering. Uh, and then uh, the second part of the presentation is going to, we're going to learn some techniques. And then we're going to talk about practice and um, principles and how you can apply uh, these things to a non-hostile environment now so that you are good at your these these skill sets uh, before you need to use them in the field. Uh, and so um, let's jump right in. So Wikipedia defines tradecraft as within the intelligence community it refers to the techniques, methods, and technologies used in modern espionage or spying, and generally as part of the activity of intelligence assessments, so these products that are developed. Uh, this includes general topics or techniques. These are de the dead drops, for example, and we'll, we'll talk about what a dead drop is later, uh, or the specific techniques of a nation or an organization. Uh, so when we're talking about the NSA or the National Security Agency, you know, the use of their encryption or encoding that they use to send uh, messages or to decode messages. Uh, and so there's different agencies that have different specializations and different focuses. And within the intelligence community, um, there's 17 of these different agencies uh, from the Army or DOD to the Coast Guard to the CIA to uh, FBI and beyond. And they all have their own different focuses and different skill sets and different sizes and resources. So some examples of tradecraft, um, you know, dead drops are very uh, popular uh, or very kind of a well-known uh, example of, of a tradecraft. This is, uh, for those that are unfamiliar, this is what's also called a dead letter drop. Um, you know, some of the spy terms vary um, differently that you'll, you'll see. Um, and some of this has to do with the origin of where spy skills come from. Uh, so, what we call in America, uh, one thing, the Brits and MI6 might call something else. And so sometimes there's different words used and also sometimes words change over the course of time too. So, um, so the dead drop is uh, basically a cache, a secret cache where you would take material, money, information and hide it somewhere. And then you would tell whomever you're working with in your network or outside of your network, where and when to get it, get that material. And so that way, if you are being surveilled or the, um, you know, someone was to get caught by authorities or adversary, uh, that only one person was of the two, or, you know, the, there's a disconnection between the, the networks so that only one person was caught. Uh, brush pass is another way to pass material, a uh, very classic example. Uh, and you can think of this as, um, you know, kind of an iconic, uh, maneuver that, that a street criminal would use to pass drugs on the street, you know, to, you know, make a, you know, a, a handshake, for example, uh, to be a pass or to drop something in a bag as someone's walking by or to, you know, in the movies, they like to do the, the suitcase or the briefcase drop where you put down a briefcase and another person picks up the same identical brief, briefcase. Um, and, uh, and there's many other, many other versions of this, of course, too passing material. Um, invisible inks and codes, you know, this is something that's been done for a long, long time. We've been using codes. Um, you know, the Greeks and the Romans have done it. The invisible ink has been around since the Greeks. 
uh, Piney the Great was one of the first to record and uh, the, written to know the, the use of invisible ink. Um, so different types of ciphers, um, you know, Julius from Julius Caesar on had been used to communicate war, um, you know, war plans and such. Um, when we talk about self-defense um, or defense in general, there's always kind of a threat cycle. Um, and in that threat cycle, it always, almost always begins with surveillance, where the adversary is going to try to measure up um, the person whom they're, they're going to attack. And so the idea behind un understanding surveillance is and in in, 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 uh, understanding counter and surveillance techniques is to be able to defend yourself from that cycle. Um, to, to use the term, a popular term uh, from Patrick Van Horn as to being left of bang. And you just want to be able to identify that there's a threat and then try to mitigate that threat. And so an operative that's working abroad, for example, knows that they're possibly going to be surveilled. And if you need to go to your dead drop or contact meeting, then you're gonna to need to anticipate that you're gonna be followed and so it's used as what's called the surveillance detection route. And that is to help identify whether you're being surveyed uh, or sur surveilled, um, and then try to put in forth some measures to either mitigate or to, um, to throw that person off your, your tail to create, again, that level of safety and security, not just for yourself, but for the person that you're meeting. Communications is absolutely important. Uh, there's lots of different tradecraft methods of communication. Um, certainly there's things like signals, uh, you know, something as mundane as wearing a, um, you know, handkerchief or um, putting a pot in a window at a particular time or standing on a street corner at a particular time um, is a form of tradecraft. Um, and these are things that you may not have noticed. And, you know, in the picture of on the slide here, for example, there's a guy in the window, you know, and that could be a sign uh, to a person's uh, on the street. Um, then, of course, when you're talking about communications, uh, meeting people face to face is super important. And there's a whole series of tradecraft in order to do that. So, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but these are called contact meetings where, uh, where two people are meeting together. And, you know, that could be, there's, again, there's a great risk involved in there. So there's a lot of preparation that comes into play when you're going into contact meetings. Um, so technology is often used in, tech, in communications, whether it be radio communications, uh, very kind of very classic um, radio communications, the beginning of the first world war, and then certainly through the second world war became very, very influential and, and uh, important. And then those that communications really kind of rapidly changed from, you know, from the radio tube to the microchip from, you know, the, the 50s to the 70s and 80s and 90s. And then now today where lots of communication is done, you know, in a, uh, in a whole new realm and that is of, of the internet. So as I said, earlier, lots of tradecraft and lots of what we under know of tradecraft comes from fiction and uh, movies, books, um, and a lot of times authors, um, people like uh, Jean Lachery uh, can takes, you know, contacts that he has and actually applying real tradecraft and real, real elements of what's used for collection um, in the field um, to make their stories come alive and be realistic, you know. And um, what's interesting is that you know you can kind of get a glimpse of the tradecraft through through fiction, but you don't always get the entire story. You don't get the entire setup and the the kind of the planning phases or the the scope of time or the the, the ways in which you can effectively train to get tra trade cut, but you always kind of get these little snippets. Um, and what's what's interesting about it is the, uh, in, in kind of modern literature and modern art, a lot of that stuff stays, has stayed the same. Um, it doesn't change. It's slightly, you know, is adapted to technology changes or uh, regional changes or whatever is needed, but 
a lot of these techniques kind of remain the same. And in, in, um, in Smiley's People, uh, there's a few kind of tips uh, or kind of a few uh, skills that are you know portrayed in the book that are, are just super time tested. So this is relying on face-to-face -face meetings, the importance of being able to meet with the person that you're talking to, uh, at least at some point face-to-face, -face, whether it be weekly, monthly, six months, every five years, whatever it is. Um, you know, always being in a private setting when handling over items of value, um, carrying items of value, like, you know, microfilm, for example, camouflaged for immediate discard, you know, so the example was the general was carrying his microfilm in a cigarette packet. Uh, the use of sign and countersign to signal, so this is this chalk and pins, you know, and what's what we, uh, a little side story about chalk and, and dead drops, is oftentimes when you load a dead drop, meaning you, you put an item in your, your cached dead drop that we talked about earlier, and then you put a signal somewhere in a different part of the town where, you know, to let the other person know that there's material, money, whatever. And so you mark very kind of iconic tradecraft was to take a piece of chalk and mark a mailbox or a wall or a light post or whatever. And in Amsterdam, uh, because of its location, it's kind of this mid-ground between the East and the West. And so the KGB and the CIA were operating and meeting and um, with other people and um, lots of meetings and things, uh, clandestine things were happening in, in Amsterdam through the Cold War. And of course, you have all the other intelligence agencies of, of throughout Europe meeting as well. And so everybody's using the same techniques of chalk to mark their dead drops uh, or to, to signal that they're of their dead drops. And it got so bad that people were missing and not understanding uh, the signals. So they had to create basically a gentleman's agreement that certain countries had certain colors. And, um, and, and I think that plays into what espionage used to be that there were some rules and there were some kind of gentleman's understandings about the treatment of fellow spies to some degree, uh, you know, not to diminish the danger, um, but the war on terrorism had changed a lot of this, um, the, the, the kind of um, civilized nature of espionage in some capacities. Uh, and in turn um, became very brutal. And we responded being, just as brutal back. And I think that that had kind of changed the tone of um, intelligence gathering, but that's a, that's a whole nother, another conversation. Um, so uh, we talked about dead letter drops earlier. Um, and then lastly here is never traveling directly to a rendezvous, never taking a single taxi to a destination. This is just an example of the, it's not quite necessarily, um, you know, a, it's a skill, but it's, it's more of a principle. And we'll talk more about some of these principles later and how you can have kind of some of these general guidelines to help you mitigate a dangerous situation that if you have, you know, that you can follow. So we'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about what's called the Moscow rules later. So why, why try, why practice tradecraft? Why care about it? Why do we even have a presentation about it? So, uh, first and foremost, I like to talk about, and I like to kind of approach this from a citizen's operative perspective. I use the term operative in much of my writing as a way in which to describe, it's a very general term, um, but it, it comes from the, you know, from operator or operative, comes from the concept of, you know, um, you're doing something with great precision. There's something that someone has learned, a skill. So we think of like an operator operating on a person. You want somebody who has a high level of skill and competence and um, to, to be the person who's going to open up your body. And the, I, I oftentimes just leave out the word citizen in the writing, uh, but really truly what I'm kind of getting at is that we can all learn these skills. We can all become essentially these operatives. Uh, we've kind of started a little bit of a, a program on the side or a little concept on the side or not program, but the concept of the wolf hunter. Uh, and this is the idea of us being a citizens being actively engaged in intelligence gathering, similar to how citizen scientists work. So if you remember back in 
the 90s when people had their PCs connected to the internet and they did this like um, uh, extraterrestrial research where everyone had their computers linked together to create these, you know, com this great computing power so they could, you know, run these, I don't know, even know if it was real or whatever, these telescopes or whatever the fuck they were doing, I have no idea. Um, it's very similar to that or uh, individuals who, you know, a scientist needs to do what's called a bio blitz where they go out into the woods and they try to, you know, count as much uh, life as they possibly can, or um, asking bird um, watching groups to help with, you know, Christmas censuses and things like that, where people are get, becoming engaged in the scientific process to help create a, a um, you know, a better understanding of the environment. Well, I, I think that there's no difference in doing this, and it's not that far of a stretch that we've we've done stuff like this before. Uh, where we had like Boy Scouts, for example, would do, you know, metal drives or peach drives during the World War II. We had victory gardens. People would stand watch on bridges and on coastlines. Um, and so it was part of the war effort. And right now we're at war. We're at a cultural war. Uh, we're in what, what some might call a cold silver war, uh, not to be too dramatic. But in that, we have this concept of people who want to accelerate this tension and they want to use that tension for their advantage. And generally these are white supremacists. Uh, this is the militia movement. Uh, we've seen these attacks before uh, with Timothy McVeigh, for example. Um, so it's nothing new. Uh, we have seen and, and witnessed these attempts uh, throughout the the coronavirus. We've had hospitals that were marked as targets uh, to create a sense of um, um, terror and kind of spark violence. We had militias showing up at protests to create violent conditions to spark this, to spark fighting. And certainly the insurrection was a, an attempt to accelerate uh, this. And we saw that with, you know, and we linked it specifically to the funding that came from the white supremacists. And then, of course, the, the anti-Semitic beliefs of QAnon. So we are all operatives. We all have the opportunity to play the role of an operative to see if you see something, say something again. It's not just like, you know, Islamic terror has dissipated and has come back. Uh, terror has come back in the form of domestic terror. And uh, we can still play that role, um, even though it's going to be a lot harder to see. You know, we think of protecting ourselves from Islamic terror because we can stereotype, we can, well, this person looks Middle Eastern, so I'm just gonna give him shit or I'm gonna tail him, you know, like um, Trevon Martin, right? That was, you know, a kid in just getting Skittles in his neighborhood and being tailed because he was black. And think of all the families and the people that had gone through the, the horror of, of the same experience that Trevon had at the end uh, or after 9-11 from the, the Islamic community or anyone who is just brown skin, just like the Asians are experiencing with coronavirus now. So we can, as citizens, be more active in protecting fellow citizens uh, in communities and neighborhoods from the rise of the threats that come from the far right in particular. So we'll talk a little bit more about this concept later, but the internet is not a area that should be ventured into lightly and as familiar as we are with it and as com as connected as we are with the internet of things the internet still is considered a very hostile environment and we'll talk a little bit more about that later and then lastly or, or part of this then too is this this concept of bringing truth to power whether it be for the you know to to withhold or the concept of having a free press to being able to whistleblow against either governments or corporations or even individuals uh, that are uh, powerful individuals, that we need to have a certain tradecraft um, in order to protect ourselves and our families to do what is right, to stand up to this power, to stand up to the injustices. And uh, it takes this, it takes a level of secrecy sometimes to do that. Uh, so I think of some of the movements in South Africa against the apartheid, um, groups and individuals who had basically created an underground world uh, to, to fight the apartheid. 
And although we're not at that point yet in America, we have a lot of people who want us to be there, to be at that, at that, at, at that point. Um, and then from a sales perspective uh, or a, a self-defense perspective, there's these sales techniques that are used in marketing and uh, propaganda uh, that if you understand how their techniques work, if you understand the ways in which people operate, like for example, surveillance we talked about, if you understand and know how it is that you're being surveilled, you can detect, if you know these techniques, you can detect whether you're being surveilled and then you can protect yourself. So I like to use the example of uh, Chaudini uh, from The Art of Influence. He writes a book about sales and influence, how to influence people. And here are these, you know, I think it was five sales techniques. And one of them is, is guilt. And so a organization might give away candy or peanuts. The Harry Krishna, I think, was the example he used in the book of, you know, these guys in airports handing out flowers for a donation. Well, they're hoping that because you have given the flowers that you'll reciprocate, right? That you'll give them money in, in return. And the money that you give them will be of a greater value than the gift that they provided you. And so a, a, to combat this technique is just to take the flower and walk away, not give them the money. Um, and, and I think that if we take this perspective of, we take what has been given, when people are giving me bullshit, you take that bullshit and you walk away. You know, you can, you can, that's where that true power is. And if we all did that, if we all were able to take those flowers, we could bankrupt these companies. We could bankrupt those organizations morally or physically, or whatever. Um, and I think if we can all be part of this, understanding these techniques, then they, they can't, they have to come up with new techniques. And then lastly is, the, is thwarting corporate espionage. A lot of times when we talk about corporate espionage in particular, we talk about protecting, you know, from an IT perspective, for example, um, it's a high level conversation, IT nerds are all into it, um, but it doesn't trickle down to the common person. And so if you wanna help protect your business, if you wanna help protect um, a corporation that you work for, um, that we're all in it together in the sense of security, this, the weakness, the single weakness, the greatest weakness in a security chain for a corporation or an organization or anybody is, is, is the individual. And this could be, these, and this could be, and often is the individual that interfaces with the public. So whether you're in the marketing department or the sales department, um, you know, these are people who are at the greatest risk of being manipulated so that they can get to your company's information. Now, it's not always trade secrets that you want to defend, right? It's also the innocent people whom the company holds information about, you know, credit card numbers, um, phone numbers, things like that, um, that people want because it has value. You know, we don't understand how much of our personal life has value and we freely give it away to companies. And then that can be used against us, um, either to sell products or for disingenuous and propaganda reasons. We saw that, of course, through Cambridge and, and Analytica and how uh, these, if this information can be used to, to motivate you to vote a particular way or to do things in a particular way. And so there are gatekeepers and corporations like administrative assistants um, and executive assistants that might not be making decisions day to day, but are close to power. And you know, it, all it takes is one click from a salesperson or an executive assistant um, on an email and the entire security chain can be broken down and you can grant access to a bad actor. So even if you don't care about protecting the trade secrets or the company or executives, you should care about the information, uh, the personal information of customers and a fellow employees and protecting people within their organization. Um, and so corporate espionage is huge um, and the bad actors are the same bad actors that are meddling in our, in our politics, Iran, China, Russia. Um, you know, in, in particular, China is, has really pushed hard in, in industrial espionage and to so much to the point that you, know, you could be driving around the middle of Iowa and see yeah, a Chinese guy running out of a cornfield stealing genetics, uh, 
you know, material. And I mean, they, they're, they're, the espionage is, he is heavy and great, is, is what I'm saying. And we all need to be, even in places like Iowa, where you'd never think um, you would see this happening, it's everywhere. So when we talk about tradecraft and we talk about implementing and, and learning these skills, I think that one of the things that we need to think about is to approach it as a moonshot, meaning that this often these operations, whether it be a simple dead drop or a brush pass or car pass where you're you know, passing a material, throwing material from one car, moving car to another car. Um, these are all highly skilled and choreographed events. These aren't something that is often done flippantly. Um, and depending on the operation and depending on the mission and the, uh, the adversary, and of course this all changes, right? But uh, you know, when there's millions of dollars on the line as there is often when uh, our intelligence agencies are, are working, you know, the, it, everything is very considered. It's planned out. Um, it's often practiced. You know, so when you know, so for example, in the Cold War, when uh, we we're getting secrets from Trigon and just a simple contact meeting or simple brush pass or, um, you know, everything that was being done was being done highly choreographed with a team of people. So we like to think of this lone operator. And sometimes it happens with lone individuals or lone case officer working by himself. But on some of the bigger operations, um, you know, you have a team of people that work with you you know, that you're practicing with, you're considering, you're, you're bouncing ideas off of. Um, and I think that this is the approach that we need to have as citizen operators, that we work together as a team. Um, and it's, a, it's an effort, again, community-wise, um, to, to do these things and not to think that you're all alone on doing this. Obviously, there's opportunities and there's times where, you know, you have to just react or you have to just do what you need to do. But the one thing I'd like to kind of say is that you can do any of these skills once, uh, but can you do them repeatedly over the course of time without being caught? And I think that's, that's the difference. So you wanna be, you wanna consider all your possibilities, uh, consider your environment, consider the techniques. You wanna plan this out to perfection. Um, and we'll talk later about planning um, but most of the people who are working you know are highly creative people um, they're using creativity to apply to their tradecraft um, but then they're also neurotic to the point that they're planning things out to the detail and details are very very important and you have to have an almost obsessive nature about yourself and your obsessiveness with security and what you're doing in order to stay protected and safe they practice everything out to making sure, you know, that you're going to do it right. So this is, you know, they, you'll do a mock um, um, uh, um, a mock dead drop and have your team, you know, one part of your team surveil the other type part of the team to be able to critique that team. Um, you'll do brush passes over and over and over again um, until you get it right. Um, and then once you're time, once you're ready to execute that uh, that mission, um, it's done flawlessly. Um, it's done right, and you are not putting yourself and the people that you're working with in jeopardy. So, in um, as far as terms go, you often hear clandestine and covert thrown around, and I've used these words I think a couple times in the beginning of this presentation. And I think that we need to talk about the distinction of this because it's very, I think it is very important leading up to the next slide. Um, a covert operation is different from a clandestine operation. A covert operation is an operation that is planned and executed in secrecy so that the identity of the agency or organization remains unknown. The clandestine operation, other, uh, is one in which the operation is carried out in such a manner that the operation is in secrecy. And so this key difference here is between uh, the identity of these organization of, of the organization or what they're doing. So 
We all know that the CIA exists, but we don't know what they're doing. So it's a clandestine operation means that we know that the CIA is there, there, but we don't exactly know what that operation is. So we didn't know, for example, the level when um, uh, UBL was was uh, uh, found and, and, and then uh, assass or assassinated, uh, was, was nabbed. Um, we didn't know that was happening until it was revealed to us. And that would be a clandestine operation. A covert operation or doing covert is the identity of that agency organization to be remain unknown. That they don't want, we didn't want, you know, there's operations that had happened that the CIA, for example, didn't want us to know that they were part of that. You know, so for example, meddling in Russian and um, um, elections or um, meddling in Hong, like Hong Kong last summer. Um, for example, that our, the way that we influenced and organized rallies and groups of people on the street uh, and our level of influence in those operations, we don't want, we didn't want uh, the Chinese government to know to the extent or that we were involved in some of those, those actions. So that would be something that was covert. Now, that we talked uh, earlier about what a, a hostile environment and um, this term, non uh, there's two different types of hostile environments that we're gonna talk about. The non-permissive environment is a term that's used quite a bit. It's thrown around like nipple tassels in Vegas. And um, oftentimes in a way that I feel that there needs to be some clarification. Um, so when it's used kind of colloquially when it's used in, in regards or in reference to the firearms community and second amendment rights. Uh, this is often referred to as an area in which you cannot carry a firearm. That is non permissive to carry a firearm. The definition of this is actually a national or subnational level of, of, you know, of, of sort of region of, of a country. Uh, in which uncertainty or instability or inaccessibility, inaccessibility or insecurity constrains the ability to operate safely and effectively. So the reason why I don't like to use non-permissive environments is the way in which to describe uh, where you can't carry a firearm is that what it's saying is that you can't operate and be safe or be an effective operator without a firearm. Um, and I think that that what that does is it limits the use of the tool of a firearm as a crutch to your own safety. And so if you feel that you can't go to the beach, for example, because you'd be wearing a swimsuit and you can't hide a firearm, um, I think you've got some issues. Um, I think that if you say that you can't um, go into a store without wearing a firearm, that you feel naked without it with leaving your house, then we have some issues. Um, and one of the things we'll talk about later is the importance of trust. And trust has not only with individuals, but I think your community. And certainly fear is used and the lack of trust is used and created as a marketing technique to sell more firearms, to sell more weapons. And you know, I think we, we need to, that's a sales technique that you need to recognize and say, you know what? I can trust my neighbor. I can trust the community in which I live in um, because I know the signs of danger. I know the areas that are most dangerous. I am informed. I have done my intelligence work to know whether I'm going to be safe or I'm not going to be safe. And so oftentimes fear is used even by these so-called trainers where they have YouTube videos and they just show, you know, these assassinations that happen. And we'll talk a little bit more about this when we talk about uh, uh, situational awareness. Um, but they use scary situations that happen um, very rarely to very specific people for specific reasons as a generality to, you know, for as a learning lesson for you and safety, but you're really not learning anything because it's not real in the sense, it's not a real statistic. Um, or calling, you know, I, I saw a study or a, a study, a report on 
on carrying firearms. You know, people like to, you know, brag on Chicago uh, because of the firearm violence that happens there. Um, and they're talking about the uptick of violence on the local transportation, the CTA. And as a person who lived in Chicago and had taken the CTA and know how safe it is, they saw, they did see a slight uptick in violence, but we've seen an uptick in violence across all of America. But the, that study, that study that, or the numbers that they were referring to, you know, part of that, the reason why there's an uptick was that people were being, people were actually caught and then they were released early because of COVID and then they would do the crime again. So it wasn't like a new person going out all the time trying to attack people. But furthermore, when you looked at the statistics, it was, it's really like from a firearm, the use of a firearm on the CTA, um, it literally was, it's a one in a million chance. There's a one in a million chance that someone's going to pull a firearm at, out at you. And, you know, the, the heart and soul or the reason why the, the laws are in place that you can't have a firearm on CTA is the fact that these trains and buses are packed full of people. So what happens when you have overpenetration? What happens when you miss? You know, you're trying to save a life by taking a life. You want to make sure you take the life of the person who's trying to take your life, right? But it does you no good if you're putting not only other people at risk, but yourself at risk. It's the, the whole concept of the idea of giving a, a, a person who is experiencing domestic violence a firearm to protect themselves. Um, but you don't know the environment in which they're working in. You don't know that, you know, and so they're, it's more likely that gun is going to be taken away from them and used against them. Um, so again, when we're talking about non-permissive environments, we're talking about the firearms in particular, I think that we really need to know the environment and we really need to know um, how an individual is going to use all of the skills in their tool belt to stay safe and not rely on a gun as in their sole means for safety. Because really people just don't use, many people carry firearms, but they actually don't ever use them, even in a mass shooting. So they're too scared to use them. So a lot of what is taught in social media and influencers and such is just a bravado to carry a weapon for, for, for the sake of bravado. So we talked a little bit of earlier about the internet and I called it a denied area. A denied area, this is an intelligence term that describes an extremely hostile, hostile operating environment with heavy surveillance. I can't think of any location more uh, filled with surveillance um, than the internet. You know, the term denied area is used to describe places like Tehran, Beijing, uh, Moscow. Um, but when we go, we don't have to travel internationally to be surveilled. You just have to be in the internet or be connected to the internet. So through the, the, the we talked about the internet of things, you know, you, you bring in a Wi-Fi camera in your house. Well, those can be easily hacked into if someone was motivated enough um, to, to turn those cameras on towards you. Um, you when you have um, Alexa speaker sitting on your kitchen counter, it's, it's, it's absorbing all the words that you're using so that it can figure out what it wants to market you, uh, what kind of products it was, it's going to get you to buy off of Amazon. You know, the, the United States Defense Department calls a denied area an area that's under enemy or unfriendly control in which friendly forces cannot expect to operate successfully within the existence of operational constraints and force capability. You know, not only are there bad, you know, actors in marketers that aren't, they just want to sell you things. They just want to sell you product, right? But there's also adversaries on there that want to take your money. They want to subject, you know, they want to, um, they just want to hurt you for the sake of hurting you. Um, and these could be both, you know, organizations like the GRU from, you know, from Russia to, um, to Chinese organizations, to Turkish hackers, to whomever. Um, but these could be individuals, these could be nation state actors, it could be anybody. Um, it doesn't have to be, um, you know, there doesn't have to be a reason to be attacked on the internet. Uh, and so there's a lot that, that's happening. And then I want to also kind of say that there's, uh, from a, from a um, civilian perspective, 
you know, with the rise of like uh, companies like Amazon, the ability to get products, you know, the spy equipment is readily available. And so people can buy secret cameras and put them up in changing rooms and hotel rooms. Um, and people are doing that. Um, and so when you go to a, uh, a bed and breakfast or a Airbnb, you know, people often will put cameras up to protect their resources, protect their investment, um, but then use those cameras to spy on your occupants. And so knowing this, you can have know the counter surveillance techniques to spot or mitigate the use of these um, of these cameras and audio devices and such. So, um, so when we think that we're not operating in a, de in a denied area of such, uh, we truly could be. Um, and we need to be careful of this, um, I, it, not to create fear, but just to know that the capability is possible. And um, when we're on the internet, in particular, we need to know, we need to look at it as being in a hostile environment um, and look at combating the hostility through measures of tradecraft to keep us safe. So I talked earlier about the difference between clandestine and uh, being covert. Um, I think that what we need to also keep in mind is there's always an association with tradecraft and some of these skills as being illegal. And I want to dispel this um, doing things, acting in a, in a state of under, being underground or off the grid or um, having a low signature, whatever you want to call it. Um, that in and itself is not illegal. People do these techniques to protect themselves so they don't get caught by their adversary or their federal police or um, the federal law enforcement or, or whomever that they're trying to stay, you know, so they could do whatever they're trying to do, sell drugs, sex trafficking, whatever. So there's always this connotation of those actions, the tradecraft is being illegal because it's associated with illegal acts. But I don't think that we should limit ourselves to thinking that organizing covertly um, as in and itself being illegal, just those acts that you would be doing. So if you're not breaking the law, for example, if you're not, you shouldn't have any problems with doing covert action. Um, so, and, and it happens all the time. It, it, it happens. You know, when you send a, if you work for a business and you send an encrypted email, there's no difference when you doing that amongst your friends or family. Um, you know, our rights in America gives us the ability to organize and to congregate together. You don't have to do that in public. Um, so you can organize and you can communicate under the radar of the government. There is, they'd have no reason to know what you're doing and what you're talking about whether it's a government or a big business. And so I think we need to have a little bit more focus on, um, on, on having that, 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 that lower signature and protecting our, um, protecting our data, our actions. You know, the Google, Google tracks people's phones and you can pull up a map and I'll show you all of the places that you've traveled over the course of years. Why does Google need to know that? You know, I mean, there's no reason. Uh, I mean, uh, there's reasons for them to know that, but it lo might look interesting to you to say, oh, well, these are all the places I've traveled. No, it looks great. Um, but that's all part of the data that's being mined out of your and what you do and your behavior. Um, and so, when we're flippant about this, we're actually becoming less safe. And I think we need to think about is being more careful about the information that we put out. So the, an example of this would be in, after the holidays, people put their you know, presents, the boxes from their presents on big screen TVs or whatever out on the street. And you're just advertising the fact to the criminals, they're driving by looking for good places to rob. 
you know, who's got the new TV, who's got the new this or new that. And essentially that's what we're doing when we're walking around um, exposing ourselves um, to criminals in, in ways um, just like that. So, so organizing and being covert, um, having a clandestine organization in and itself is not illegal and those actions aren't illegal. Now, a lot of what we're, we do in tradecraft is creating a sense of deception or what's called pretexting in the IT community often calls this. Uh, deception is used to obtain protected information. It's most often, most often it's deception is in the form of pretext. And a pretext is as it relates to industrial espionage involves assuming and identity assuming an identity or appearance of another's own in order to cloak the person's real intentions, which are the solicitation of protected information. Now that's from an, an, in a corporate espionage standpoint, but we do this all the time. We use deception all the time, whether we call it deception or not, um, you know, uh, to pick on women, putting on makeup is a form of deception in a way. And so wearing a wig in itself is not illegal. Um, wearing makeup obviously is not illegal. Deceiving people is not illegal. Um, there is a line between what is legal and what is illegal, but there are, you know, going by a nickname is not illegal. It's not identity fraud or, um, you can still go by, you know, the idea here is we're looking at some looking at things with a little bit more moral ambiguity. We're looking at the world a little bit more gray. And we're going to try to ride that line, that moral line. And the intent of riding that line, of, of going into these areas where deception is used, um, gives us additional level of safety, just like being covert you having that blanket of safety that people can't see us, they can't hurt us. And so deception works in the same gateway. So when we talk about deception, um, you know, I like to bring up the, the uh, Tony Mendez, who was made famous uh, or popular by the movie Argo, who was portrayed by Ben Affleck in the movie, was exfilled, uh, was an exfil uh, expert, but he also was the, the disguise expert for the CIA and became the, the chief master disguise uh, guru for, for all of CIA. And where he got his inspiration from was um, magic. And magic is just, you know, sleight of hand. It's deception. And we use that as entertainment. And he took that and applied that then to tradecraft and was very successful at it. And I think that this concept of sleight of hand for the intent of protecting oneself or one's country, I think is important. Um, and again, it kind of pushes us to a line where things are, aren't just black and white. Um, so there are many different categories of intelligence. I'm going to talk about just a few, and I'm actually not going to spend a lot of time in any one of these other than the first one, which is human intelligence. Um, but what I want to do is I want to, I want to kind of, kind of introduce individuals who are unaware of these different elements of trade of, of intelligence gathering so that they can start thinking about how they can approach using uh, resources in a different way in which we in the intelligence community or those in the intelligence community use to gather information. So there's human intelligence or and there's acronyms to all of these, right? So like in the alphabet soup, that is our government, um, which is human. There's image intelligence, um, imminent, open source intelligence, signals intelligence, SIGINT, and measures and signals. So signatures, sorry. Um, so when we talk about image intelligence, these are the, these are the ways in which we are uh, using and collecting images to gather information. And, Images can be gathered through the use of, so, of mobile phones, cameras, you know, digital cameras, um, and these can be operated by individuals even on the ground to gather intelligence. 
And, you know, this is a very, very important part of intelligence gathering. You know, people, I, I like that there's a story of a, um, an, an operative named Billy Waugh who would, would work, he went into um, Libya and worked in, as a, I think it was a, a National Geographic photographer. I forget what he posed for, but he had a cameras and he, you know, he did a lot of photography work um, in, in Africa, North Africa, um, did a lot of and with his surveillance, did a lot of work with gathering and pulling information in, in uh, intelligence on, you know, Carlos the Jackal, the, the, the uh, terrorist. Um, and so it was a very, very important part of the, his operations to be able to get these images back to lawmakers so that he could make a decision of what to do next. Obviously, we all have cell phones in our pockets these days. And this is a military grade tool. And I think we need to think about it that way. Um, you know, the, 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 the cell phone is so powerful, not just because it connects us to the internet, but because of the technology that was in there. It was developed, you know, through our, de our Department of Defense, you know, from the microchip to the camera lens. You know, their camera lens that we have in satellites, for example, is that much different than the type of technology that was applied to the camera that's on our phone or the GPS technology that's used to locate ourselves on a Google map. Uh, or this, you know, oftentimes it's, I guess it's um, cellular triangulation. But the point is, is that we have weapons grade material uh, or technology turned into civilian technology in our pocket. And I think we could use that to our, our advantage. Um, and I think we do. And we see a lot of that of bringing truth to power with filming police officers, uh, for example, that had overstepped their... Um, you know, over overstep the line of um, of their role and, and decency. So, um, the other thing I'll mention too, because we we talk about you know this is cameras and you know surveillance and motor and vehicles that are done, and that's that's obviously happening with the police, but with the civil with the civilian grade drones that are happening these days. I mean, you can buy a drone for a, 100 box 200 box that has outfitted with a, with a camera on it and use it for your enjoyment but um you can also use that for, to gather intelligence as well um and that's not something you know it's, it's a good example of some of this intelligence you know capability that we all have that we can buy telephoto lenses we can buy drones and all of the same equipment that is used out in the field by our, uh, our Jason Bournes uh, out there is the same technology. It's no different than what we have access to. Of course, they have some special stuff that were some very expensive stuff and a budget that could be a little bit better um, depending on the operation. But we have the capability is what I'm saying. Is we all have the capability um, and, and very powerful capability. And with that, we don't talk about geospatial, but you know, things like Google Maps, for example, is another tool, right, that can be used for intelligence gathering. And you can get a lot of different types of intelligence just from, you know, geospatial uh, information. And Google Maps certainly gives us a lot of information and a lot of capacity. Open source intelligence constitutes most of the intelligence gathering that happens. It's the cheapest form of intelligence gathering. Now, um, open source used to be that you had to go and um, get information that's in the public domain that was often hard copy. So this is, this is and, and what it is, is anything that's legally available that's open to people. So this is information that you can get in the newspapers and yearbooks, and, uh, newsletters, you know, so you could subscribe to a newsletter. Uh, let's say you're, there's a church that you are following for whatever reason, and they have a newsletter or an organization of some kind, whatever. I mean, you could subscribe to that newsletter and read the newsletter and get information about what's happening inside that organization or the people inside that organization. Um, and so but before the internet, that means that people would have to travel to those locations to get those newspapers or you know, the information, those records, and those types of things. Now everything's on the internet and it's available. Now, just because it's available doesn't mean it's always free. So you might have to pay to, you know, on like white pages, for example, to get a little more information, criminal records, license plate numbers, all of these things that, you know, federal um, 
you know, information is available. I love, I love the fact that like people who in the prepper community like to talk about two-way radio or, you know, the use of two-way radios and ham radios. In order to operate a ham radio, you need a ham radio license. In order to get a ham radio license, you have to have a record. Uh, so anybody who's a ham radio operator, you can go to the FCC and pull up their address. And so you go through great lengths to have a lower um, signature and keep a lower profile, but then anyone would know any, you know, where you live in a matter of seconds by just going to the FCC website. Now, again, if you know someone's name, you can just go to a phone book. Um, but um, there are, of course, a lot of numbers and addresses unlisted. So, so the, the difference between open source information and trade secrets is that there is public right to access to this information. And so oftentimes from an espionage standpoint, we, are, we want to hold on to these trade secrets uh, because they're important to that corporation. From a personal perspective, everything in your life you should consider to be a trade secret. Everything in your life should be a trade secret. Where you go, what you eat, what you buy, that should be a trade secret. And we should have the same levels of protection about ourselves as corporations do about the products that they sell. So open source in intelligence is a whole skill set. Um, you know, human intelligence gathering, a human intelligence gathering is only constitutes about 11% of all intelligence that's consumed or that is uh, provided. Um, so there's, it's a great, this is a great area. Um, uh, one great story about open source intelligence I'll share is, and this is a YouTube video, fairly popular one about open source. So you can, you can find it readily. I don't have the name of the person available to me right now, but um, it's, a, it's a great example of the power of open source intelligence. Uh, he's an investigator, I think from Florida, if I'm not mistaken, a uh, private investigator. He does open source intelligence gathering for this uh, agency. And someone posted a picture on Facebook of price of gas on a, uh, on a um, uh, at, at the gas station. He was very proud of the fact that he had paid so little for the gas. He wanted to show his friends on social media on Facebook. And so that the, as, a, as an experiment, um, the researcher basically what he did was he wanted to find out who this person was. Um, and so from this picture that was posted. And so what he did was he took the, the, the reflection in the gas pump that showed the tail light of his vehicle. Um, and he was able to use that then to isolate the location of this person through the, the year, the make and model of the car from the tail light and kind of extrapolate information that he had off of just an image. And certainly, this can be done even you know, with metadata. Uh, this can be done with just looking at previous posts that you would post. And then you could take and kind of stitch together the story of a person's life that they're putting out there on, on, on social media, for example, uh, and get a whole idea of who this person is, what their motivation is. So if you're trying to sell somebody something, for example, you could go into their social media page and an idea of who they are, what their motivators are, and then use it in a disingenuous way to get them to be motivated to do something that you want them to do, like buy a product or whatever. And so open source technology is, or, or intelligence gathering is something that's very accessible to everybody. And there are some paid tools and there are a lot of free tools out there. So you can go to our website. Uh, we have a whole section on open source intelligence uh, that I've gotten from, um, collected from other people, posted on there of different sites and different places you know, for reverse image searches to the Internet Archive Wayback Machine, where you can see, you know, update uh, um, what websites look like pre-update, pre-updates, um, all sorts of information that you can you can gather um, that is is free and paid, that's available to us, to everybody. So even if you can't get out into the field, you're part of a group. You know, someone or others within the group could be, you know. Um, gathering intelligence through social media and through open source. Signals intelligence is something uh, also something very, very much available to civilians. 
Um, signals intelligence is the information derived from the interception of signals from communications, electronics, and telemetry. This includes oral communication, telephone communication, email communication. You know, intercepting email communication might be a little bit harder, um, but it can be done if you know the person's login and password. Uh, telephone communications, again, harder to do, um, but you can intercept communications traffic through things like stingrays, which can be easily in, in different uh, RF sniffing um, devices. For, for $200, you can buy something that's going to get the frequencies of um, you know, your garage door open or to your, the car door uh, key fob that you have to unlock a car door. Um, so in a way, that's kind of signals intelligence gathering that intelligence uh, is very capable. Now, oftentimes when we're talking about signals, we're talking about actual communications. And certainly the use of radios is being done uh, right now, again, because they have assumed low signature or no, there's no traceability in the use of the radios by the far right, whether it be for organizing events or at the events themselves. A lot of these people are using frequencies in which you can intercept and you can listen into um, at these events or leading up to these events. Um, you just have to be willing to take the time to scan for those frequencies, but they're all readily available. Uh, the popularity of the UV5R uh, Baofeng radio, uh, it's a ham radio that costs about $30, creates the entry level to ham radio that um, people are taking advantage of, both on the, on the far right and, and somewhat to the left. And you can intercept you know, you can reprogram this skill, this radio, because it's it's design. It was designed and made in in China that you can actually reprogram it so that you can use it as a makeshift scanner, so to speak, and scan and use different frequencies, transmit and receive those frequencies. Um, you know, trunked radio is becoming you know municipal radio is becoming more and more trunked and, and encrypted. It's harder to you know have a scanner, but in many places, still police fire and all that, still using an unencrypted or analog radio that you can scan and listen to. Um, many places, you don't even need a sophisticated machine to do that, you can go online, you can download an app to have that too, even if you didn't have the sophisticated machines. You can buy scanners that do trunk radio. You can make that with a simple dongle for a software defined radio to sniff radio waves, the radio signals. Um, so everything is very much accessible uh, in terms of, you can set up a, a, a listening post, very cheap, under a $1,000, a very effective listening post, very similar to what um, any agency might have or that is capable of. Um, certainly, they have better technology, better stuff. But, you know, the NSA has great programs because on um, um, open source uh, that is available because they know that, like the citizen scientists, uh, that are out there, they can rely on programmers to come up with programs to help them with encryption and signal de detection and all that, um, and using the good hard work of, of civilian work, civilians engaged in this. And they've opened this up to this. So if you're a programmer, if you understand you know, this area of communications, there's a lot accessible to you through the NSA in a, uh, in a, in a very kind of neat and exciting way in many ways in which we can work with our, our government to protect ourselves. Uh, so signals intelligence is something that's very accessible. Um, measures and signatures, I'm not gonna talk a lot about because honestly, I don't know a lot about it. It's not my area of expertise, but oftentimes um, this is what we was referred to, or it is what is referred to in terms of radar intelligence, acoustic intelligence. Um, you know, so, um, uh, and a lot of this has to do with NBC issues of nuclear, chemical, and biological intelligence. Um, you know, one of the things that I think has escaped on the in the American landscape in in the pre-COVID life, life was the use of our intelligence agencies in understanding the threat of the pandemic. This is nothing new. The pandemics were nothing new, right? We went through a series of pandemics before Mars, SARS, or, or SARS, and um, and the bird flus and all this stuff. And so we've had an infrastructure in place, in particular in China. Uh, to be able to listen in. I mean, we have the NSA listening for a reason to lawmakers and policymakers and scientists 
um, we knew about this information. We knew about the pandemic um, well before in, in you know November, right? Uh, and a lot to do with the hard work. They can't talk about this to the public, so it's not going to be recognized. But you know, our government had made the conscious decision um, to not do anything, to not protect ourselves. We had months, you know, um, we had November, December, January, February, March. I mean, almost half a year of time of, that could have been in preparation of making masks, of preparing, you know, getting more respirators in the right places, of securing the border, um, of doing all the things that, you know, instituting hand washing, all the things that we could have done. You know, hindsight's always 2020, you know, for sure. But the idea is that we had the intelligence, the policymakers decided not to do anything with it. So there was nothing broken from intelligence perspective on coronavirus. Coronavirus was not a black swan incident that a lot of people think it was, that it just came out of nowhere. It didn't. Um, the intelligence products that were created, just like the, the, in 2016 that were created to talk about the um, dangers of uh, adversaries meddling in our election, elect, electoral process, what that could do um, was ignored for political reasons. And when you ignore dangers for political reasons, bad things happen. Um, and that is what we learned out of the last four years. Um, and you can go through policy after policy after policy. Um, you know, we spend millions of dollars for absolutely nothing, essentially, is what it, what it comes down to. Uh, we put people's lives at risk for absolutely nothing. Um, both those that are serving this country abroad and the citizens within. And so I think what we need to think about when we look at nuclear, chemical, and biological intelligence, that it's all possible. You know, and when we talked about nuclear intelligence, again, I mean, this is, you know, we, we were at a point of tension with, South, with uh, North Korea, where General Mattis was sleeping in his clothes every night and going to the cathedral praying for America and our safety. You know, if a person like that is so concerned for our safety, you know, I think that that to its core should rattle people, that people should think about what that look, you know, what, what, what was going on at the highest levels of our government at that time. And then you think about how we had a false alarm in Hawaii and why that might have happened, that things were so jumpy, that there were so things, we were so jumpy that a false alarm had happened. These mistakes don't just happen in the, you know, in, in, in the military. They happen for a reason. Um, and that reason there was this just increased tension. And so certainly that's what got me. I never ever, I thought of people in the prepper community that are ready for nuclear strikes to have bomb shelters were crazy. Well, when we have bad leadership, it becomes a reality. It becomes, you know, and so we have a video specifically on an NBC kit that people can put together. Had, I had was inspired after learning about how dangerous the situation was and uh, for our country and for, our, for the American people. And then certainly the pandemic um, and the, the ability of chemical weapons to be used against Americans from, from terror, um, not only Islamic terror, but domestic terror, I think is a, is a thing and biological terror being used specifically by the far right um, with spreading the coronavirus going around, cough, literally people coughing on people or not wearing a mask intentionally to spread the virus uh, to, to be because they know that though communities of black and brown people, the marginalized communities are, and sick people in their communities were at greater risk. And they were intentionally trying to spread the, 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 the virus around um, to, um, you know, to make America white again. So human intelligence is really where we think about um, a lot of tradecraft and tradecraft skills. So this is this is information that's gathered uh, from you know in whether it be other agents, from informants, uh, human assets, 
that are out there. Um, and this is kind of that kind of, well, when we think of classic tradecraft skills, we often think about this, the elements of human intelligence gathering. Um, and it's all about relationships. It's all about knowing and reading people. It's all about gathering information about people to use that information against them, similar to how the internet and these large companies gather information about us to motivate us to buy things. Uh, and so what we can do is we can understand how human intelligence works so then we can mitigate uh, the threat of human intelligence, but also we can use this for our advantage to increase the capacity or the functionality of our organizations, groups um, that we're, we're organizing in if we're trying to bring, say, truth to power. So I, there is no way I have enough time to talk about all of the different tradecraft basics, but every Tuesday we post on uh, tradecraft on the website. And so I welcome you to, do, if you're interested in the topic and you want to get a deeper dive on some of the, the uh, elements of tradecraft, um, you can certainly visit Black Swan Outdoors uh, to get a, a good archive of, of tradecraft. Where I like to start when we talk about tradecraft myself is what I call the Jedi mind tricks. Um, and these we've done extensive um, podcasts on, uh, in, in, in particular on situational awareness, things like the gray man concept, um, OPSEC, lie detection, character assessment. These are all soft skills that I think are way more important from a, a self-defense perspective that are often never talked about, or even if they are, it's kind of glossed over or misunderstood. And we can spend lots and lots of time on this, but this is a good example of, you know, these are skills that anybody can have um, to, you know, if you're, um, you know, a parent and you want to know if your kids are lying to you, you can pick up on these, you know, lie detection skills um, to, it's, it's all available, right? Or being able to read a person, you want to be a better salesperson, you all, you probably should do good character assessment, learning about in, emotional intelligence, for example, um, to understand what motivates somebody to do the things that you want them to do. Um, and then just general operational security practices put in place to protect yourself, your family, your organization. Uh, what are these, what are those broad skills that you can use to kind of apply to protecting yourself? And again, that applies to situational awareness and becoming more defensive in nature in the way in which you approach your environment. So situational awareness is often thrown around quite a bit. Uh, it's often kind of misunderstood as well. It's people think of situational awareness as being kind of all knowing and being able to absorb everything that's in your environment, uh, being aware of what's going on. And that's just not the case. This is a mindset, this is an attitude for sure, but it's about being able to collect the right information to identify the right threat, but then also to project your actions based off of that information. So you have a predetermined idea of how you are going to react to a specific situation. So it's not necessarily just being aware because you can't fully be, you can't be fully aware of the entire environment. Like again, we use the example of Jason Bourne because it's a great clip that everybody uses as an example of situational awareness of him sitting in a cafe saying that he knows, you know, the license plate number of this car and who, where the nearest gun is. And, you know, it, it, yes, you can be aware to that level. You can be attentive to that level. But the idea here is that that's missed is that the reason why you're gathering this information is so that you can make decisions about how you're going to act in specific contexts. And so if you know that there, you're in a dangerous area and there's a particular bad actor, then you can know exactly how you are going to prepare yourself for that condition in case that bad actor say comes after you or whatever. I don't I'm trying to use a, a better example here. So what is not is just keeping your head on the swivel. So, there are a lot of people who train in self-defense, firearms community in particular, that like to use these YouTube videos, CCTV cameras of, you know, like assassination attempts, for example, or um, to say, well, this guy wasn't situational aware because the gunman snuck up behind him. Well, how the hell do you know that someone comes, is coming up from behind you? You know, the lesson in the situational awareness is being out in public if you know that you have a contract 
on your on your on your head and acting as if you know life is going to go on as normal um you there's no way that you can mitigate somebody acting erratically you know yes there are signs and and you can see body language but not everybody has the ability to read that body language um to know those those little indicators um not everybody has the ability to to have that level of training nor does that even guarantee that something bad is going to happen um so a lot of times people use hindsight as a way to teach situational awareness um but it's not done in a way that really makes a difference and effective so oftentimes when they're using this example they use the color codes from colonel cooper and colonel cooper is a firearms defense uh, or firearms teacher um i believe the 80s and i'm not sure when he passed away maybe early 90s um or early 2000s uh but he taught these color codes and the concept behind the color codes was where he came about it was training soldiers uh, because we had noticed is that people were, were hesitant uh, infantrymen were hesitant to pull the trigger when they had to come when they were faced with a a, um, a life and death situation um that even after all the training and all the competency skills that they had there was still was something that was keeping people from pulling the trigger from essentially protecting themselves and their and their and their uh, and their fellow um, infantrymen and so he needed to come up with a way in which we could prepare people to pull the trigger effectively and so he used these color codes as a way to help people understand that if this condition happens this is how i'm going to react so you don't have to think about it so you know already how you're going to react and that would help people so that they don't have to decide at the last minute should i shoot him or should i not should i use my firearm should i not and that's really where the heart of situational awareness was is is, is applied in a self defense perspective so it's it's a much broader topic than that and we talk in depth about situational awareness um from a psychological physiological and emotional component um but you know the color codes is something that is often talked about so when we talk about being in condition white, that means you're tuned out. That means you're not conscious of what's really happening around you. And think about it as being a highway hypnosis. You're driving on a highway, you're thinking about other things, or maybe you're engaged in your cell phone, you're listening to the radio, you're tuned out to what's happening in an environment around you. You're not picking up the stimuli that is happening. Condition yellow means that you're relaxed, you're not, you're, maybe you're conscious of what's going on. You're making your, your conscious decisions while you're driving, um, but you're you're not, there's no threat. There's no threat environment that's around. Now, orange might be the possibility of a threat is there. Um, that maybe it's an unknown threat. Uh, you don't know exactly what that threat is, but it's it's potential. Um, so you stay focused. Um, so you're going through a bad neighborhood or you're going through an area where, um, I'm trying to give another example for driving, um, where the roads might be a little bit more dicey. Um, you know, there's no real specific threat out there, but you know, maybe you just want to stay, maybe there's deer, there's the potential of deer on the road. So you want to stay focused, um, and you're not, you know, you're not, um uh you're not in any real danger but there's danger out there red is high alert there is danger about right so you've come across a criminal he has a weapon he pulls her up you're in red you need to react a deer walks out into the road you need to react do you swerve do you stop um you know what 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 is the what's what is that that action that you need to put into place. Um, there's an added el element, which is black. This was later added to these color codes of black is your comatose. You're so in fear of the situation that you can't react, that you're incapable of reacting. So uh, a very common thing that happens to you know everybody that you hear a bump at night, and you're just laying in bed, you're sleeping, you hear this bump at night, it wakes you up, and you freeze. 
your body freezes. And for what feels like minutes, you don't react. That fear of whatever it was creates a, a sense of being almost comatose. Now, certainly that might only happen for a couple seconds or a second or whatever, um, but that delay delays your ability to react. And you don't want that you know, to happen while you're you know, in a combat situation, for example, right? Or while you're rock climbing. Um, I've seen that as a climber, I've seen people become so over, um, overcome by their fear, or their, their, their fear is basically has dictated their ability to function. They're, they're so afraid that they can no longer function while they're climbing. Um, and training and experience, all this stuff, there are all these parts of things, understanding how fear works is all the stuff that you need. But it all kind of boils down to some situational awareness is experience and being able to make the right judgments and judgment calls comes with experience and you just have to gather experience. And so it doesn't matter how many training courses you take um, and firearms or how much practice you do. If you don't have experience, if you're not gathering experience and being actively involved in, uh, you know, in, in situations, then you're never really going to fully understand how you're going to operate, how you're going to be effective. So I like to use the example of police officers. They have basic levels of experience that are required for their job. Um, they have opportunities to practice beyond that of what civilians can, because they have their own ranges often, sometimes not, but what many police departments do, they have access to, to, to ammunition um, in, many, in many places. They have access to, on a personal level as well, advanced training um, and practicing personally outside of the range. Yet, in the instance of Brianna Taylor, for example, um, fear overcame some of those police officers. Some became comatose. Some became so fearful that they just started shooting. And even, I mean, wep they were shooting stuff out windows. You know, and this is close quarters. Certainly, this was a scary environment, but this was probably, I'm guessing, maybe a first or one of the first of these experiences that these police officers had. So just because you have training, just because you have gotten trained or that you have access to and you take the time to practice doesn't mean that you are going to be able to react the way that you think you're going to react. And I think this is a great example in the prepper community with all of the time and money that's spent in emergency preparedness. And then when the emergency actually happens, they have no idea how to do how to react or what to do. They don't execute their, um, their plans because it's not politically um, uh, motivated because of political motivations, uh, they don't see the threat in front of them. Um, and so again, that's a basically basic situation awareness. You have to be able to see that threat for what it is uh, and not be mitigated by disinformation and propaganda. So when we talk about human development, we're talking really about agent development. And this is no different than courting um, and starting a relationship with somebody, uh, whether it be like a romantic relationship with the idea that you're going to get married. And to those motivators, there's some common motivators in which you can get somebody to do the most heinous thing, which is to go against their country. Um, and that acronym is MICE. And, MICE stands for money, ideology, coercion, and ego. Now, certainly money works as a way to develop a person. You can easily get people to give you information by giving them a little bit or a lot of money, depending on what information you need. Um, but not everybody is motivated by money, believe it or not. Not to do the worst of crime known in, on, on many countries' law books. Ideology is a much more important driver. And ideology is something that's really been driving the tensions in America today uh, that we see. But ideology, similarly, is also the same kind of tensions that have driven the divisions of, say, through the Cold War, the development of the Soviet Union. Uh, people disillusioned by you know, the, the Marxist intent of communism never being actualized because of authoritarian rule. Um, as, a, as an example. So there's plenty of people who were, um, you know, from an ideological perspective, happy to fight um, the, the, all, the 
and later the oligarchs, but the authoritarian leaders um, within their government. Um, so ideology is something that kind of goes beyond oftentimes what money is able to provide. Now, so oftentimes people know the value of what they're doing and they're going to ask for money as well. Um, coercion is something that is, is also functional, you know, that uh, we used with our enhanced interrogation techniques, um, but it's not always effective. It's not long-term effective. It's not always, you can't always trust information when you're torturing somebody. But certainly the thought of blackmails or um, other acts, criminal acts against people to defame people, uh, things of that nature can be motivators too. It happens all the time, in particular in IT world. So to use that IT example, you can, you can have a company and an IT specialist who recommends a millions or thousands of dollars of the latest and greatest of software and hardware. Um, but if I go to the store um, and buy a, a $10 ball peen hammer, um, I can threaten somebody <laughs> with that hammer and get the passcode to get into that system. Um, and you're, everything that you've, there, a whole architecture of security has now fallen apart because of the ability for me to apply stress and pressure on an individual. And we can do this through blackmail, you can do this through um, any number of ways. Um, so again, it goes back down to when we talk about corporate security, those individuals becoming that, that weak link, the people not knowing how to keep the company secure, why or what they're keeping secure. By far, probably the most effective way to turn a person or to operate a person is through the use of their ego. And um, this is something that is being used quite readily um, through the rise of the far right in America in particular to develop and get more people involved in their, um, in their cause. But it's, it's, the, it's the single greatest use of an agent's time in developing a person's uh, ego as a weapon and against themselves. And uh, it wasn't just the CIA that had figured this out, but also the, the, when the uh, KGB at the time was trying to recruit Americans, they used American ego as a way to, to do it. And I think I talk a lot about ego when we talk about situational awareness, when we talk about gray man concept, um, and in general, we've done some posts on ego and how this is kind of a weak point for a lot of people and a lot of people who want to consider themselves to be an operatives, that this, this is the chink in the armor, so to speak, of many, many people. And understanding your own ego and what motivates you and how your ego drives you is an important part. Um, and it almost, it's, it's that Zen-like, uh, monk-like perspective of getting to that next level. So people can operate at one particular level, but you can get to the top, the tippy top level by understanding um, and almost in a kind of enlightened way of how to control and um, how to, to manipulate your own ego um, and uh, to free yourself from the imprisonment of that ego. Um, and so you you can obtain kind of that yeah that 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 next almost spiritual level of you know that that those Jedi Knight skills you know become attainable essentially if you have the ability to beyond go beyond your ego, and that is something that most people can't attain to, and it takes oftentimes a lifetime of experience to get to. So another skill, and we talked a little bit about this earlier, is this is the surveillance detection route or the SDR. Now, um, for professionals that are working out in the field, they use their detection routes every time they're gonna have a meeting with somebody. So you know if you're being tailed, if you're being tailed, you call off that meeting, um, or you can shake the possibility of being tailed. And it's just something that you do in reaction, whether you even know you're gonna be tailed or not. Um, and so if you're just gonna do a five minute meeting or 10 minute meeting or whatever, um, this is the aspect of what's not portrayed in movies or books is that it takes a lot of time planning an SDR. You actually have to take the time to plan that out. And then to execute, it takes time. An average SDR could take three to four hours of your time. Now, again, this goes back to applying 
tradecraft skills to civilian use, do civilians really have the time to, to do a three or four hour surveillance detection route to apply that? You know, um, no, they probably don't. And so oftentimes we shortcut, you know, we think we know what we're talking about, but then when in actual execution, we really don't know because we didn't do the proper planning and we didn't do the put the proper time into the execution of that of that craft. Um, so if we want to know if we're being surveilled, we have to do, you know, go that that extra extra mile. Now spies have to do it in such a way that they can't be detected. They have they cannot let the adversary know that they know that they're being surveilled. So they have to do this at a completely different level in many ways, whether you're being the FBI or not. You know, we FBI has their own group of people who are experts at surveillance and, and the, the world class at surveillance, learning all these techniques from the from a lot of the techniques from, from the KGB. And we've surpassed the KGB or now the FFSB's capacity for surveillance um, through the use of our, our, our FBI. Uh, but it comes with an, you know, when you're doing if surveillance, it comes with a huge infrastructure of 10 people, or multiple cars and costume or, you know, disguise changes even and all sorts of you know, radio communications um, It can, can become quite complex. So if you're a spy and you're going against an agency, whether it be the FBI or the KGB or whomever, um, you know, you're going, if you're doing a surveillance detection route, your, your, your adversaries are dozens could be dozens of people with dozens of cars and dozens of, of disguise changes depending on the level of threat that you you hold now for ordinary people <laughs> you know your your private and detective right that's being paid by the hour of the day isn't going to spend hours and hours and hours of time of their clients money following you right or or the determined uh abusive you know husband or boyfriend isn't often going to spend hours and hours of time and sophistication. So you don't necessarily need to apply a great level of planning and um, using a four hour SDR, depending on the level of your adversary. This could be a, a series of just three simple left turns while driving, for example, or popping into a cafe, um, you know, one particular stop along the way to, to be able to know if you're being surveyed um, or having a notebook with you or on your phone, keeping track of the different people that you're seeing um, through the course of your day. You know, very simple techniques. So we can take this and we can apply that then to our own safety again. So we know there are specific areas, uh, baggage carrier, baggage handling areas, or um, pickup areas in airports, the taxi stands, um, hotel lobbies, all these places while we travel, these are key places in which there's heavy surveillance by criminals for criminal activity. And so we know that once we end, our situational awareness will tell us that once we enter these areas, we need to be a little bit more cautious. Who's following us, right? These are the pickup areas where they're gonna find you, identify you and, and see, you know, if you're getting off of uh, regional transportation off of a train from the suburbs and going into the city for a business meeting. You know, when you're walking off the train, you're getting onto the street, that's a transitional zone that surveillance might be, people might be looking for you, um, make, looking for a mark. Um, leaving your office at night, going into a um, parked car garage is another transition zone where you know, surveillance might be posted to, you know, to where you are, where you're getting up in the morning if you're a person of interest, uh, you're getting up in the morning, you're leaving your hotel room or your, your home, you know, that's a takeoff point, that another place where surveillance is going to be posted um, to begin the process. So understanding this, how surveillance works, how situational works, this is all where it starts kind of coming together. But I really want to emphasize that with all of the tradecraft skills that we're learning, you don't have to always be at that heightened level of the elite operator you just need to be aware of some of this basic stuff and applying the basic skills, depending on your adversary and the skills of your adversary. Operational contacts we talked about are super important. These are when we, those, those personal meetings. Um, and this is just a little snippet of an operational contact. There's a lot more to this, um, but 
you know, the, your, when you're thinking about meeting a, 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 whether it be an agent or a, an asset or whatever in the field, um, it's a very dangerous position uh, for both you and in particular, the person that you are getting information from. So there's an acronym to think about, um, to, to think about how you're meeting. Uh, first is security for both you and your contact. Now, a lot of times when people talk about situational awareness, um, as, it, and as it relates to being out in the field or you know, out at dinner, whatever, they, one of the classic examples is, um, I am the male and I am going to be responsible for the security of my family, for example. So therefore I am going to sit at a table facing the, uh, the door in case there's a threat that comes in. Now, the reason why this is often recommended when you're at a operational contact is so that the person whom you're meeting with, their identity is, is obscured that when people are walking into that place or walking by that place from, from a window, that they're not identifying who you're meeting with because they have to now, you know, they're in that area that they might be, they might frequent with friends, family, coworkers that might come by and then see that you're meeting with some stranger, you. And that might trigger some questions. It might trigger somebody to come over and talk to you. Um, you're protecting the identity of the, of the person that you're meeting with. And so we take that concept and we apply it into the civilian world. And we try to, and people try to teach that as, as a means of situational awareness, but it really falls short in actuality. Because what you're saying is that the, your girlfriend or your wife or whomever is incapable of identifying that a threat is walking through the door, that you, the man, have to do this. Um, or you, the, 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 the security professional of your family, so to speak, is the one that's capable of doing this. But furthermore, what you're doing is you're putting your family in front of you at the table so that if, if a bad actor did come in, some mob boss came in, um, no one's going to do this while you're having, you know, enjoying your chicken tenders at Applebee's. I mean, give me a break. But the idea here is that, you know, if that bad actor were to come in, if there was a mass shooting, you just put yourself behind the human shield of your family. I don't understand how that's protecting them, right? You're, you're valuing their, the, the response, you know, uh, the life of your family to act essentially as human shields. They have to walk around that table. So people talk about knowing your exits, which you should do. And that's part of the security process of, of an operational contact for sure, or getting, you know, just a simple meal knowing where your, your exits are, but you got to get to those exits. So if you put your family the furthest from the exits and the closest to danger, and you're saying that, well, I'm going to save them and all the people in this restaurant because I'm carrying a firearm, you got to be, you're fucking, it's a fantasy. Because again, like CTA and, or on mass transit, there's bodies running around. In, this, in the chaos of a, of a shooting event. You have a moving target. It's low lit. It could be a, a restaurant that's low lit. Um, it could be further away than what you're comfortable with to make that shots or multiple shots. You know, people have this assumed um, perception of what they're capable of. But have you ever had a mass shooting in front of you at Chili's? You know, you're, you're preparing, you're putting yourself in condition red or condition even orange for absolutely no reason with no intelligence gathered to say that anything could potentially happen. And then you're creating a situation, a security situation that you're, you're creating more danger for the people that you think you're protecting solely on the idea that you could potentially have a, a, a heroic response by using a firearm instead of putting your family next to the exit and getting them through that exit fast and, and, and not having to need to pull that firearm out. Because likelihood is, again, like I said earlier, you're probably not gonna do it. Most people don't. No, it happens, yes, it's an outlier. So security is really important. Um, and thinking about that rationally is important. Um, how long you have, you know, many times when you're meeting with, with people, you're doing it, there's an alibi, there's an alibi, there's a, there's a reason why you're meeting or that, that there's a time gap that you're taking advantage of or whatever. 
So you don't have to, you have to establish how much time you actually do have to actually meet so they can get back to whatever they need to do. Uh, so that could be something important. It could be minutes, it could be seconds, it could be even days. You could be doing a training at a hotel or a cabin or something and going through all the tradecraft training that you have to do to protect yourself, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, so Intel, you know, why are you meeting? Is it even important to meet? Is it important enough to me? Well, if you're establishing a relationship, yes, it could be potentially important. Um, if that relationship is already established, then is it the material? Is it money? Is it the ability to keep this person spying for you? So you really, when you're actually meeting in person, it should be, there should be some action. You know, this is why people hate meetings in general, business meetings that have no end, that have no purpose. There's nothing that you've achieved at the end of that meeting. It's pointless. And so people are meeting just for the sake of meeting doesn't get, doesn't achieve anything. And that's, you know, again, to take the civilian context, it's, it's, it's frustrating. And then lastly, you know, if you do get cut short, right, if the, someone knocks on the hotel room that you're meeting, you need to figure out, um, well, well, again, why are you meeting and, you know, you, what, what that cover is, but, um, which we'll talk about in a second, but then also, you know, when are you going to meet again? Are you going to reconvene at what location, you know, an hour from now, the next day, a week from now, is it going to be next year, whatever it is, um, the next conference, whatever. Uh, and so if you did get cut short for someone coming across or, you know, seeing you approach, being approached or at that cafe or in that hotel room, what's that cover? You need to establish that in advance. So if someone comes into your hotel room, you know, and you're caught with another person, are you going to pretend that you are both lovers um, it, with a with a secret rendezvous? Um, are you going to, do you have a specific cover of why you're meeting? You know, is it, you know, um, if you want to meet and say in a, a movie theater, um, movie theaters have always been these kind of classic places for meeting rounds of spies outside of city centers and like the suburbs, you know, you go to um, driving, you know, 30, 40 minutes outside of a city to go to a cinema at parking lot is a great, you know, is many, many places or even restaurants or cafes, things like that, that are out in the suburbs are great places for meeting. And, you know, sometimes if you wanted to establish, you know, that is your meeting or even in the, even in the movie theater, in particular, you need to establish that pattern. So you need to start going to movies, right? To so say, well, I'm a movie buff, so I'm going to go to these movies. And then you have a reason to go to that movie, for example. So, so you need to have a cover. And uh, that cover could be, yeah, it's something as simple as that is what we just talked about. Could be, you know, a full cover legend uh, that, a, um, you know, in, an agent or a police officer like to take on the, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a full, um, um, undercover operation, right? Um, but you don't need to have to go that far. You just have to have a reason of why you are meeting um, in case someone asks or sees you on the street. So if you're in that cafe and someone walks by in the window and does spot you, you can say, well, yeah, I was, this is a job interview or this guy I work with at work or whatever it is. So we talked a lot about these, these skill sets than within tradecraft, but there's also these rules or these kind of principles that you put into place. And these rules are kind of little tidbits that have been picked up over the course of time. Um, and that are shared amongst other intelligence officers and rules were kind of put together into a list. Um, and these were all people who were working in Moscow station in particular that had de kind of developed this list. It was top secret list in fact, uh, but became, um, public uh, a few years ago, uh, I think there was like maybe 47 or 40 something principles, I forget, um, that were on there. And, they, you know, there's like 10 that are very popular, you can just Google and search for, but they call it the Moscow rules. And these are basically become guidelines to help you operate in a dangerous environment, the things that you would want to kind of keep in mind as you're operating on your mission, uh, or on your oper in your operation. Um, it, here on our blog, we've created our own rules, um, declassified for you, uh, 50 rules, uh, some of which overlap with the original Moscow rules. Some are completely new and different, so you can check out um, the, those rules uh, on our website. 
or I can I can send you a, an email. You can email me at um, www.blackswanoutdoors at protonmail.com and happy to send you a copy of those uh, of those rules. Um, but so not only when we understand or thinking about tradecraft, we're we thinking about these specific skills that you have to develop, but also these principles in mind to, to, to apply. Now, I want to talk a little bit about these some principles in general, not specifically the Moscow rules, but I want to talk about just as a final note, uh, the duality of some of these principles in which you in, as an operator need to think about as you're heading into and using tradecraft. Uh, so the people who are using tradecraft success, uh, successfully are often very creative, um, very creative people. You know, a lot of there's time-tested techniques and using creativity based on your environment, based on the technology, based on your conditions is important to be able to tweak and change those, um, the, the opportunities before you. And it takes a great amount of creativity. On the other side of the spectrum, you also need to be fairly in tune to detail um, that you need to be obsessive in, in, in many cases in order to making sure uh, that you and your assets are safe uh, because you know the stakes are real. Um, one of the, the other duality that you have to think about is that although we're talking about being unseen and the actions that you do unseen, you also have to be very attractive, especially when we're talking about human intelligence. And I see a lot of people who want to teach tradecraft or want to teach elements of tradecraft um, in classes, for example, I've seen uh, Element, I've, I've, I've seen like uh, podcasts and reviews on classes where people talked about the skills that they're learning, but what they're not learning is how to be attractive to another person, whether it be physically attractive, emotionally attractive, ideologically attractive, that you have to be able to know what motivates people, uh, but you also have to be a person that other people are going to want to be around or want to give up secrets or want to um, to risk their lives for. Um, and if you're just a pure asshole, if you're um, immature, if you are not professional in your approach and you can't build relationships, if you have a hard time building relationships amongst the people that you live with in your family, this is probably not something that you wanna look into uh, to be a part of. Um, because again, you have to be able to be, you know, part of being attractive is also being manipulative too. Um, so there is a lot of ambiguity. We talked about this in deception. There's a lot of lying that happens. You have to lie to yourself. You have to lie to the people around you. And you often lie to people to protect people. You protect them from being, uh, from knowing what's going on from, um, but you're also protecting the operation. You're creating compartmentalization. Um, and you have to do that internally with yourself and your values. But you have to know that there is a line to where the lying stops and where the lying begins. And so there's a kind of a phrase, I forget who uses this, uh, who used this to attribute it to, but you tell the truth to your boss, but you lie to everybody else. And I think this is kind of a mantra, an unspoken mantra to most salespeople. You know, they lie to your customer as much as you possibly can to get them to sell. But you, at the end of the day, you have to, you, you can't lie to your boss. You have to, um, you have to provide the right numbers, right? Or the right whatever. Um, so uh, in this game, in this game of, of grayness, of moral ambiguity, um, it's also a game where you can't make mistakes um, because mm -hmm. people's lives are at jeopardy. And it could be that people are losing, could lose a job. It could be that they lose their life. It could be that they are getting imprisoned, depending on what you're doing with the tradecraft. Um, so you really have to think about that moonshot um, operation when you're trying to apply tradecraft and operational security and all these elements into what you're doing. Um, and don't be, don't let your ego get to the best of you. But when you're in this, when you choose to be in this game, you're pitted against professionals and it's professional against professional. 
Everyone is trained and everyone is just as focused as you. You're not any better than anyone else because you've read a blog on Black Swan Outdoors or a blog post. You know, you don't really know what you know until you know it. And to think that other people aren't as equally trained or as focused as you means that you don't know who your adversary is. And so I think that's where a lot of people on the far right feel that they have the um, advantage over those, uh, those you know, quote unquote leftists, right? These softy snowflakes, because they have the upper edge or the advantage of being um, in, a, in a community um, that is, um, what would you say, defensive in nature, but not knowing that there are others out there um, that could be in, in equal to their, their capability, so to speak. Um, so what we're doing here is not about, it's not as much about strategy. People are smart. All people, lots of people in the intelligence community, it's an entire community of smart people. Um, it's not about strategy uh, outwitting people. You, can, you can't outwit anybody, especially when all things are equal and you're going against professional versus professional. What you're doing here is you're playing a game of tennis and you're forcing an error or waiting until someone makes a mistake. And once they make that mistake, you have your in, you have your opportunity and you have to be ready to move. Um, so it's not about who has the best strategy, who, you know, what you can do um, to overcome. It's about waiting for that, that time, that mistake that the other person is gonna have. And so much of this, whether it be in tradecraft itself um, and understanding um, society uh, as well, to some degree is that, um, and, and to be successful in a business perspective, it's all about adaptivity and adapting means winning. And if you can't adapt fast, you can't win. And so much of the cultural issues that we're going through globally with you know, um, populism and nationalism and all this stuff is, is a lot of, in, of economic angst. There's a lot of angst that we have about how quickly our world is adapting. Moore's law is pushing the limits of, you know, the microchip um, in the same way that our culture is being adapted and changing as we are learning to communicate faster, more closely with each other in different ways um, in, in doing business and transporting and, and uh, applying the technological advances um, to our cultures. And just like in nature, if you don't adapt to your environment, you, you can't move your genetic material through to, um, to success, to the fitness of your, your, your biological community. And it's no different. So we have to change. We have to adapt. We have to find um, new techniques and new ways in which we see the world. And we can't let ego get us, keep us from being able to do what we need to do in order to obtain that. Um, and so in closing, uh, I just wanna say thank you for taking the time to, to take the class um, and to learn about Tradecraft. Again, we only kind of got to the scratch the surface of what Tradecraft is and even the blog, um, the Tradecraft Tuesdays uh, is just surface level um, about um, what it means to, um, you know, to, to develop a, a robust um, security culture or techniques in which you can obtain information and use that information to defend yourself, your country, your community, your people. Um, and uh, it, is, this is, it takes time and it takes development, it takes experience, but everything is attainable. Everything that we talked about here is attainable for anyone. Um, and there's so many opportunities and so many different areas in which you can learn about it, whether it be digital security, physical security, um, learning how um, and using these skills, most importantly, in your everyday life. Um, you know, you can learn other elements of self-defense, like Br Brazilian jiu-jitsu, but can you take Brazilian jiu-jitsu and apply it to your job? or to your family life, you know? Yeah, there's lessons to learn in martial arts for sure, 
uh, about your ability, your capability and stuff, but you know, can you take some of that skill set and actually apply it in a, in a, in a good way? Because uh, at the end of the day here, um, you know, it, it, takes, it takes a village to raise a child, I think. And um, in that, we have lots and lots of kids that are coming up uh, behind us uh, with new and exciting ideas about a, a new and exciting future. And our job is to making sure that they can actualize um, this for our future. Uh, so with that, uh, again, I want to thank you. Please visit our website, www.blackswanoutdoors. From there, you can get our podcast. And uh, obviously, you're seeing this on YouTube. So um, you can see that we have uh, videos. We're doing more videos uh, as well into the future. So stay tuned for more products, more uh, um, uh, posts. And uh, uh, thank you again.